Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining uh, the Young Legal Aid Lawyers while virtual this evening. Um, tonight's event is on access to justice for victims of trafficking, and it's part two of our trafficking series. Um, earlier this year, we had part one, which focused on trafficking in a different context, but this is mainly focusing on the criminal aspect of things, exploitation, but also uh, sexual ex exploitation as well. Um, so we're really delighted to be welcoming such an amazing panel this evening. I'll be doing introductions uh, shortly, um, just in, in advance, just to let you know the um, event will be recorded um, and you're welcome to post your comments and questions in the Q&A and um, we'll be able to answer in the Q&A section of the event. And uh, just to introduce um, a bit of the format, we're going to have each of the speakers speak for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have the Q&A around 7.40 p.m. Um, I'm Hafsa Hussain, I'm a Young Legal Aid Lawyers Committee member, and I was called to the bar in, a few years ago now, and I'm really excited to be welcome to a great panel um, tonight. And in, by way of introduction, I will uh, introduce speakers in the order that they're going to be speaking, but I will do all the introductions first and then I will pass on to our first speaker. So um, we're joined this evening by uh, Ginger May, who is a speaker and member of the organization Survivor Alliance. Um, she'll be sharing her experiences of uh, trafficking and will be opening the event and giving some insight into uh, su uh, survivors' perspective on trafficking. And then we all also joined with Henry Blackson QC, uh, who is a barrister at Garden Court Chambers, and he has a practice encompassing a range of serious criminal offences. Uh, Henry Blackson QC is also leading criminal silk and a master of the bench of Middle Temple. And in the recent important ECHR judgment in VCL v UK, Henry Blackson QC represented VCL in his application to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And this was the first time the court had considered the relationship between Article 4 of the Convention and the prosecution of victims and potential victims of trafficking. And Henry Blackson QC, alongside Michelle Burr, also represented VCL in his appeal to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. And uh, we are also welcomed by um, Professor Felicity Gary QC, who is um, who has been admitted to the International Criminal Court and also the specialist chambers in, in The Hague and uh, in the Bar of England and Wales and also Australia and particularly Victoria and the High Court role. Uh, she also has ad hoc admission in uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong and Gibraltar. And as an international QC, um, Felicity Gary QC is regularly called upon to handle serious, complex and sensitive trials at every level of court. And her work mainly involves international and human rights elements, including genocide, war crimes, uh, torture, terrorism, homicide, uh, and biosecurity and human trafficking and other major areas as well. And she recently, she assisted in the reprieve um, from execution of Mary Jane Veloso, who raised her status on death row as a trafficked person and also contributes to numerous publications, including human trafficking and modern slavery law and practice. And uh, Felicity is also a professor of legal practice at Deakin University in Melbourne. And she teaches on contemporary legal challenges, uh, including war crime, modern slavery, terrorism, and climate change. And uh, Felicity has also been involved in um, government changes leading to modern slavery and was uh, appeared, appeared in the BAFTA nominated FGM documentary, The Cruel Cut. And also she was um, named a weekly barrister of the year in 2020. Congratulations again on that accolade and um, was recognized in Legal 500 as leading silk and fearless and independent minded. And we are also uh, joined by uh, Rebecca Bain from Dowd Street Chambers, who specializes in crime appeals, extradition, and crime related public law. And Rebar routinely represents victims of trafficking who are subjected to criminal prosecution at pre trial, trial, and appeal stages, as well as seeking administrative relief if necessary. And in addition to defending serious allegations of serious violence and organized crime, drugs, and firearms conspiracies, uh, Rabar is also instructed in criminal cases um, characterized by technical evidence as well. And so that is just a brief introduction to all the speakers. And I know that in my introduction, I can't always do justice to all the great work that they're doing, but we're going to be hearing more about the uh, individual speakers um, work in this area, as well as their reflections um, on access to justice for victims of trafficking. Before I um, go into detail um, further, I'm going to pass on to our opening speaker first, who will 
be giving her pers personal reflections on um, you know, from a survivor's perspective, but also it's important to see what it's like from um, survivors themselves. And when I use the term victims, it's just in the, the legal context, but um, in this context, I'm using the word survivor. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Ginger May from Survivor Alliance to um, give an introduction into her experiences and to open the event. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you so much. Um, I am a survivor, um, a victim of modern slavery, human trafficking, um, or slavery, servitude, and uh, forced or compulsory labor. Um, I'm a survivor. Um, I was um, served last year in, um, in March. Um, I've been survived in, uh, I've been trafficked in two parts. The first trafficking happened in a church in a charity where I was forced to, um, to, to forge documents. I was forced to transfer funds and, and, and make fake invoices to, to fake accounts. So um, this person I, I, I was working for in this church, he had a, a lot of cases, a trafficking case, um, child trafficking case, but people were, the police were looking for him. They wanted to find a way of arresting him but they didn't have that evidence to, to have him arrested and deported. So this man used to use people that were illegally in the country or if you're waiting for your immigration and um, you're not allowed to work. So he'd call you and say, come and work for me. And you start to work for you, for him. He'll say he'll pay you money. But at the end of the day, he won't pay you money. And he'll start requesting for sex so that he can pay you the money that he owes you. And this man owed me 6,800 pounds in total. He never paid me the money. But there was a case which came up and I had to go to the MP, report to the MP. And the commissioner was involved. Police knew about it. They had a case of rape. So that case of rape, the police knew, the judges knew that he's using people that are illegal in the country. They don't have documents, but they said they're not going to do anything to those people. So um, right now where I am, I'm in a safe house. So when I look back, I wonder why nobody said that we have been trafficked or we're being used. Because by that time, which is like six years ago, they should have recognized us as being trafficked or being forced to work or doing fraudulent business for this man. So that case passed and um, the same priest introduced me to, to a lady whom I went to work for. And this lady had a child who was seven years old. And um, the time the child was seven, I worked there for nearly nine years before I was trafficked in the same house. Um, there was a, a son who was involved in drugs. I was selling drugs for him. I was washing for them. And I was, you know, each time he comes home, when he's had a fight, I don't know whether he's stabbed anybody or somebody died. I don't know. He just come home covered in blood. And I have to clean after him, wash all those clothes, and the mother will get rid of him. That so many times I wanted to report somewhere, but I couldn't report anything because it's more like I was covering the crimes in that house. And the son had a gun. When I went to one priest and told him, oh, this is what's happening in the house, that priest, because he was collecting money from them, especially the mother, should go to him and say, pray for my son. I want him to be protected. So the man will be praying for them and will collect money as seed, you know, these African pastors. Then, because I didn't have money to give him, he'll go and report me to the woman and I'll be in trouble. So one time, the, the, the son came with his friends and they threatened me with that same gun. So I had no one to tell. I had nowhere to run to. I was scared of going to the police because they kept on threatening, saying, if you go to the police, police come here and find this grant, you will be deported. So they were using that against me. So for years, I was depressed without knowing that I'm depressed. So how did I, how did they rescue me out of that situation? I was sick. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't think straight. So around Christmas of 2019, I had a red eye on the right side. So I called the GP to go and see the GP. The GP said, it's they're fully booked. 
So I had gone to my auntie's for Christmas and she said, let's call 111, we book you, you go to accidents and emergency, it will be faster because your eye is too red. We need to find out what is causing your eye to be red. So when I went to the accidents and emergency, they took long to see me and everybody who was looking at me, they were sympathetic because my eye was so red. They thought maybe because it's Christmas, New Year's Eve, maybe somebody, I had a fight at home or something. So when I eventually went in to see the doctor, which is a good thing for the NHS because the NHS are, are, are called uh, the first responders. The doctor looked at me. My auntie was like, oh, she's got diabetes. Maybe it's diabetes. So the doctor asked me, are you sure you have diabetes? I said, yes. He said, your diabetes is actually even very low. So what's causing your headaches? I said, I don't know. I was just looking confused. Then he told me, go and see your doctor and tell your doctor, I sent you, I'll put it on the system. You, you have depression. So I went and told my doctor. My doctor didn't waste time. She, she referred me to, she gave me a link, Bromley Mental Health. I contacted them. Bromley Mental Health, they started to, cancel me they did an assessment i was severely depressed i was i had severe anxiety and um the woman said can i refer you to social services vulnerable adult social services i said no you can't do that because i'm illegal in the country i don't have documents if you do that i'll be in trouble with the home office so she said no 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 it's not a problem because at the mo right now you're vulnerable can i refer you to it is okay i said okay she said, we'll give you where to stay. I said, okay. So when she referred me, they called me and I started talking to this lady. I told her everything. I just spilled everything. Everything was out of the bag. And after two days, police came to the house. I didn't open the door for police, but I saw them. And in our house that time, there was CCTV because the, the, the very man was stabbed. He almost died. And now they put CCTV. So I saw them. I didn't open the door. Two days later, again, they came. So social services called me. I was too scared to, to open the door for the police. I said, if they find drugs, I'll be in trouble and I'll go to prison and I'll be deported. So I didn't open the door. So she called me, you should have opened the door because police said, we already know about that house. That house is a troubled house. And if she's staying there, we want her to come out of that house. So I went to the police station. I gave my statement and they asked me if we could persecute them. I said, no, I can't have them persecuted unless I set up something. If I had known about this system, I would have set it up already so that you find me the time I'm selling drugs to them at 3 a.m. They used to come at awkward hours. Sometimes there'll be a fight in the house. That's how I injured my, my right leg and my, my back. I have a problem with my, my right leg and I'm going for physio. So I said, if I had known about this, I would have spilled it out a long time ago we set them up so that police can come and find him but you see where i'm staying is in a gang of a drug um drug dealers i don't know who is who because he used to say as long as i'm in that house i'll be protected so who is protecting me they know me i don't know them so i was trying to protect my family as well so um after two days, the police officer called me and said, I've got a letter for you. This letter is from the NRM and the NRM, which is the um, National Referral Mechanism. And it was written home office. But because I was so depressed, I was thinking, I thought I said it in my mind, but apparently I, I, I spoke it out loud and said, shit, why did you involve these people for meaning the home office? Well, how come we involved them? And the lady laughed and said, no, we are the same. We are the same system. So I said, what do you mean you are the same system? Because home office are the last people I want to deal with right now. She said, no, no, it's safe. The same, the same people, home office, they're called, the, the NRM, they're the ones who have given you this letter because they have assessed your case and they found that you have reasonable grounds to conclude you are a victim of modern slavery. So they are going to accommodate you and take you to a place. So when I left the, the place, I went to the letter. I looked at the letter I didn't trust because it said home office. So I tried to run away, but I couldn't because I had severe depression. And I thought I just I, I, they could only give me a course for one month, I'll be okay. But I couldn't think straight and I was sick. And that's the time there was this COVID. That's when COVID-19 was just starting. So I had to surrender and Salvation Army came and picked me up at my sister's house. 
and they brought me to where I am right now in a safe house. So where I am in a safe house, I came in, I realized, because uh, there are some charities which are contracting with the Salvation Army. So when you're in that safe house, these people are somehow not so much knowledgeable, okay? They won't give you the information you want. But because in that church, in that charity, I was working in the office, I like to search for things. So I started to search, I looked at the letter, Everyone who was in this house, they didn't even communicate with the NRM to tell them all oh, the client is now here with us. It was all quiet. We're entitled to so many things that they're not even telling us that you're entitled to this thing. Some people have left the NRM and gone to nurse accommodation without getting anything that they're entitled to. As long as you're under NRM, you're entitled to so many things. So what happens is sometimes what happens in the safe house, there are people we live with who are criminals. Some people have been to prison, okay? Some people have stabbed Then right there in prison. They'll ask them, I don't know what they say. They end up in the safe house as well. So we go through hardship because of the trauma that I had. I had the trauma of people fighting. I used to see blood then you have someone who is here, who's been to prison, being aggressive against you. I've, I've experienced a man coming, waiting for me at the top of the stairs with a knife. You try and report it, they don't even take that much action or remove them or do anything. Somebody will just come and wait for you with a knife. They don't want you to go to the fridge. So even if you're in the safe house, you don't feel safe still. You feel like you're, you're, you, have re, you have been re-trafficked again. You have, they've served you, bring you into the safe house, but again, it's like you have been re-trafficked because you're still going through the same trauma. You're still going through the things that you were going through. Where I was living, if I have something new, like a new duvet, a, a duvet foam or, or duvet set or pillows, They'll take all those things from me and give it to the grandchildren or give it to the son or whoever is there. They'll take all my things in the safe house. I buy my own stuff. I'll buy things. Those things are being taken away from me. When I try to report, nothing is being done about it. It's not like it's... I know most of the times they like to blame the home office. Sometimes it's not the home office. Sometimes it's the people that are working there with their attitude. Recently in another house, somebody went and stabbed someone. I'm sure those people were complaining about that person being stabbed. Then when it comes to legal aid, some people for you to get legal aid, they struggle to get legal aid. For me, I have legal aid. I came here, people didn't even have lawyers. So I was telling them, look, when I came here, the officer told me I'm entitled to certain things, I'm entitled to this. But they'll answer you and say, oh, you, you, you don't have documents, you're not entitled to anything. So I say, yeah, I'm not, I don't have documents, but under the NRM, I'm entitled to certain benefits. I'm entitled to a lawyer. Can I get a lawyer? Oh, we're looking for a lawyer. It took them time to find a lawyer. I had to look for a lawyer myself. They are the ones who are supposed to do the job. I start to do that work as a survivor. When I found that lawyer, they are all using the same law firm that I'm using. We're entitled to have bank accounts. They were quiet. I had to search for them and tell them, go to this bank and apply for this. Now people have got bank accounts. I am involved with a lot of charities. I'm like Survivor Alliance. Survivor Alliance has helped me with a lot of things. I'm speaking to you now. I have confidence of even speaking publicly because of Survivor Alliance, but where I am in the safe house, what are they doing? nothing they're not doing anything and this is another thing i'd like to say about lawyers um if a trafficking victim has a statement to give you you have to take seriously what they're saying and record it correctly because if you don't record it correctly the moment it goes to court it will be something else if you remember when i came into the nrm i gave a statement to social services. There's a restatement I gave. I said a lot of things which even myself, I can't remember up to now. So if you are a lawyer, you come to me and ask me, can you tell us A, B, C, D? I won't be able to remember. One, I, had, I have depression. 
maybe when I was saying that I was too emotional, I let everything out, even things I need, I, I, I didn't even mean to say. So it's best for you as a lawyer to go back and track my step and go back from where I started from and get the original statement so that it goes well with the home office. If the moment you mess up, you miss something, then the whole case is destroyed. Some, some survivors have had their cases gone wrong. There are so many things we want to be done for us as survivors. The trauma we go through, we're still going through the same trauma in the NRM and still we're going through the same trauma when we apply for asylum because the only route we have to stay in the country, like for me, I've been trafficked for 10 years, then I have to start again with questions with the asylum. Why are they interviewing me? Because the interview I'm doing as a survivor should be enough for them to, to work on my case. Why, why should I start those interviews again, going through those traumas, trying to prove what? That is so unfair for us survivors. I'm sure there are other routes they can use to give us. We've been working, I'm not young, I'm 51 years old. I've ended up with sicknesses, I've ended up with diabetes, now I'm on insulin and I received the letter that I'm high risk. I, I, I don't sleep in the night, I have problems with my leg. All these things came in and manifested after I, I came in the system. But I thank God for Red Cross, I, I thank God for, for Survival Alliance, I thank God for Sophie Hayes. Where I am, diabetes is expensive. I, I need to eat healthy food. They pay me 65 pounds, which I was being paid the first day I entered this country because I came on a voluntary visa and I was getting 65 pounds. That is 14, 15 years ago. I'm still getting the same money, which is not enough for transport, which is not enough to pay my, uh, my, my phone to use Zoom. It's not enough for anything. So I get some extra money from Survival Alliance or, or, or Red Cross. Once in a while, they'll send you a food voucher. And Sophie Hayes, if you're having a session with them, they'll pay for your, for your phone bill. Um, thanks so much for sharing, um, Ginger, your reflections and experience and also how um, Survival Alliance has kind of supported you in um, accessing the right um, support and in terms of the safe house and, and I'm really interested to hear uh, more about uh, their work with with survivors in, in general. Um, I have a few questions but I'm going to save them to the Q&A so please do uh, stick around but it's it's fine if you um, we can only stay for, for a portion um, but thank you so much for uh, sharing those reflections. I hope we can come back to some of the points that you mentioned as well later. Um, but thank you so much. And um, I'm going to be passing on to our next speaker, which is Henry Blackson QC. Um, thank you so much again for joining and I will hand over to you now, Henry. Yes, well, good evening. And it's a great pleasure to be um, speaking and joining you all this evening. And can I say it was very important, I think, to start with those, um, with the ex direct experiences of people who uh, have, have been through this. I mean, as lawyers, particularly if you're in my position as a as a QC, you're you're a long way up the the, the pecking order, and um, we're dealing with people's real experiences, but at a distance, because we're dealing with the legal arguments which arise and the consequences, uh, the way that they are dealt with within the system. But but it's it's extremely important to be reminded of the fact that we're dealing with you know, real people's lives uh, and real experience. And, and I thought if I just pick up on one point that was, um, I, I thought very, very telling in, in, in what Ginger said, it's, it's this whole business about re-trafficking. I mean, I'm a criminal practitioner. And so in, in the context of, um, of human trafficking, I'm dealing with the, um, the way in which the criminal law tries to grapple with the, uh, the, the problem of the prosecution of people who are victims of, of, of human trafficking. But one issue which, which comes up, and I think 
particularly I, I'm thinking in the context of a, a particular cohort of, of, of people who, who um, come before the courts, people um, mainly, mainly Vietnamese, young Vietnamese people who end up working in cannabis factories who are almost invariably victims of trafficking. One of the problems which you find is that their engagement with the criminal law is only a small part of their problem. And that let's say they've been wrongly convicted because they've been wrongly advised to plead guilty and or whatever. Um, if they have their convictions quashed or if they serve their sentences and are then released, what very often happens, I'm afraid to say, is that their, their troubles have only just started again because they end up in the arms of the people who have got them in that position in the first place because they have nowhere else to turn and there is no proper support mechanism for them. So thank you very much for um, starting in that way. Now I've been asked to specifically um, address the significance of the recent decision of the European Court of Human Rights in the case of VCL and AN which was decided we had judgment, um, we had judgment recently. It's a, there is a possibility that the case will go to the grand chamber, but I think that's a bit unlikely. It's a first chamber decision, uh, but there was a, um, the British member of the court, um, Tim Ica, um, was a member of the, um, the court in this case. So I, I think it's unlikely that it will go to the, the full chamber, but it is a decision of, um, of real importance and, and what it focuses on is um, the problem which lies at the heart of these cases, which is the, the balance between the court, the, the state's responsibility to protect victims of trafficking, to, to identify and protect victims of trafficking, and the state's responsibility to prosecute people for the commission of serious offences. And it's that difficult balance that the courts have been, the appellate courts have been, have been struggling with for some time. I've, I first got involved in this through um, a, 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 an ex-member of my chambers, Michelle Brewer, she's now an immigration judge, who's, who's an immigration practitioner. And she wanted some, some um, help with a uh, clients of hers who had been convicted and who uh, wanted to be able to challenge their conviction. And through, mainly through the work that she did, we um, were then involved in a, in, a, in a series of cases in the Court of Appeal which addressed this. The first case, however, which had been raised was a case called O back in 2008 in which the, 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 the late um, Lord Justice Lords lamented at that point the failure of practitioners and the system in general to, uh, to recognise and identify victims of trafficking. That was a case of O, it was a case which involved a, a, a young woman uh, who was prosecuted for a, uh, a fraudulent um, documents. Uh, which is a classic, absolutely classic case of, of, uh, of um, of trafficking. What then happened after the case of O was that the court slowly but surely developed the law. But in 2012, um, Lord Judge heard uh, the case of VCL and AN. He presided over the case of VCL and AN, which is the case which has ultimately ended up in the European Court. And in that case, uh, he was, uh, and the court was, very concerned uh, to limit the, uh, what they saw as the extension of the defense of duress. Because as we know, the definition of human trafficking, although it emerges in the context of transnational crime, does not require uh, trafficking to have taken place across boundaries, for, across, across national borders. I mean, very often victims of trafficking will indeed ha have been brought to, the, to this country from abroad, but, 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 
that the, the simple fact that that um, you 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 may have uh, arrived from from another country is not a um, a requirement for for the definition of uh, in the definition of trafficking. And so Lord Judge said that essentially the protection against prosecution, uh, the non-prosecution provisions in, in Article 26 of um, the European um, uh, Anti-Trafficking Convention should be confined to the sentencing decision, essentially. Um, two years later, he was presiding in another case uh, as a result of increasing concern about the, um, the courts failure to, to address the, the extent of the problem with, 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 with trafficking victims, uh, a case called, uh, uh, there were five joint appellants, a case called LC. Uh, and just as in the previous case, which involved young people who'd been working in cannabis factories, there were, in, in, the, in the subsequent case of LC, there, there, there uh, again were a number of appellants who, who were in very similar situations. But in, in the subsequent case, the, the law was further developed and most of their um, convictions were, were quashed. Following that, um, VCL submitted to the Criminal Cases Review Commission that there were firstly um, additional factors in his case. He, he, he had a medical diagnosis of, of post-traumatic stress. And also that the decision in LC, which had followed his previous appeal, had effectively developed the law in a way which required the case to be reconsidered. And so his case came back before the Court of Appeal, this time with Lord Thomas, uh, who was then the Lord Chief Justice presiding. And again, his case was linked with uh, four other cases uh, and the courts were principally concerned to, uh, again, to, to, to limit the availability of, of the non-prosecution provisions to, to victims of trafficking. The problem, I'm afraid, that VCL had, appearing before Lord Thomas, was the previous decision of Lord Judge, because the Court of Appeal were effectively being asked to overturn a decision of a previous Lord Chief Justice. And indeed, um, uh, I, I'm afraid to say, lamentably, I was unable to persuade the court to quash his, his um, conviction. Uh, we uh, asked them to certify a point for the Supreme Court uh, with submissions which were um, perhaps, um, well, were highly critical, can I put it like that, <laughs> of the Court of Appeals decision and uh, Thomas didn't take too kindly to. Um, and so it, so it was, we, we'd exhausted, he had exhausted his, his um, available remedies uh, within the United Kingdom. Uh, I more or less dropped out of the picture at that point and Michelle, uh, who was, who, who'd been representing him throughout, took over his case because she was acting for him on his asylum claims. He won his case in the immigration uh, tribunal. Uh, he also um, received, he also sued the Home Office and received um, quite a large, uh, well, he received, he, he received payment as a, as a result of that. And what then followed was a petition to the European Court. Um, I would like to be able to claim credit for the eventual decision, but I'm afraid I can't really. I, I, I had some involvement in it. But the petition was, was, was drafted by Michelle and, 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 um, uh, Emma Simmons and uh, Stephen Clark at, at, at Garden Court. And it is uh, a very significant decision. There's no doubt about it. Um, the European Court has found that the United Kingdom uh, violated the rights under Article 4 of both of the appellants. Um, and uh, I think it may be the only example of, of the United Kingdom being found to be in violation of Article 4. And they also found, um, equally significantly in my view, that there was a violation of his uh, Article 6, his fair trial rights. And that really came down to a highly critical judge assessment of the way in which the Court of Appeal of those two previous occasions had dealt with his case and dealt with the case of the co-appellant um, uh, AN. Um, uh, and essentially, uh, in, in 
the European the, the European um, Court judgment, um, the, the European Court decided that the failure under Article Four was properly to protect both of these uh, young men uh, by sufficiently investigating the circumstances which had led to them being arrested. I mean, this is a short form um, account of what happened, just to put a little bit more detail on it and, and only a little more detail. They were, as I've indicated, uh, both cases involving uh, young people who had been arrested uh, in cannabis factories. And it has been known to the authorities um, for a very long time uh, that, that cannabis factories, which for, for reasons which I don't understand, uh, appear by and large to be controlled by Vietnamese crime gangs, depend upon uh, using um, trafficked victims uh, in, to work in them as, as gardeners. And they're, they're, they're kept in, in, in um, dangerous conditions very often. Uh, because they've come from Vietnam with a promise of being able to get employment and be able to uh, make their way in the world, uh, but without any other contacts and having arrived effectively through people smugglers into the United Kingdom, they're extremely vulnerable. They're entirely dependent upon the people who, who, who's into whose control they are passed. And uh, even if they are able to 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 leave the, the, the you know the, the the place where they are they're, they're, they're looking after minding the cannabis, the reality of their situation is that, that they have nowhere else to turn. They're entirely dependent on the people who are providing them with 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 such limited resources they get in order to um, in order to support them. So the issue is um, in in those cases is is the is is firstly. Uh, the extent to which they should be, uh, they are entitled to protection as victims of trafficking. And secondly, whether or not the offence which, for which they've been arrested is, is sufficiently serious to justify a um, criminal, con criminal prosecution. Well, so far as the latter point is concerned, uh, in that particular category of case, case the courts have, have decided that, that effectively working in a cannabis working in a cannabis factory is not a sufficiently serious uh, offence to, to, to warrant prosecution in any event, which is not, I have to say, the way the Lord Judge approached it um, back in 2012. The live issue which, which continues, um, uh, and which I think is, uh, for, for those of you who, who deal with these cases um, in the, on the front line now, is the, um, the extent to which uh, the decisions which are made by the National Referral Mechanism, who is the body who have responsibility for in investigating uh, um, victims of trafficking, the competent authority, which is now the Home Office, the extent to which their decisions about whether or not somebody is a victim of trafficking are relevant, firstly, to the question of prosecution, and secondly, if prosecution goes ahead, the question of whether or not the decisions of the competent authority are admissible in criminal proceedings. And, and as you will all know, I'm sure, um, prior to 2015, uh, the only protection that you could get was by, um, was by a, the first instance court uh, staying proceedings which had been brought on the basis that they were an abusive process or if you were convicted and appealed um, the appellate uh, court's decision uh, on, on the same grounds. Now, of course, uh, the uh, defence under Section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act is the is provides the it is said the protection. I mean, there are problems with Section 45. There are problems in particular because victims of trafficking very often are reluctant to to spell out exactly you know how they've got into that situation and to name the people who are responsible. So it's it's a you're in a bit of a quandary. But since the decision of the Court of Appeal in the case of DS uh, now, um, that is the only protection you have effectively. But DS left open the question of whether or not decisions of the, um, the competent authority are admissible in criminal proceedings. And uh, you may well know, those of you involved in these cases, that, that, it, that, that relatively recently, the divisional court 
has uh, in an appeal from a magistrate's decision, uh, a case state magistrate's decision has decided that the decisions of the competent authority that somebody is a victim of trafficking are indeed admissible. It's a case of M. And uh, <clears throat> it's a very important decision, seems to me. Uh, it's particularly important for young defendants. It, it was a, uh, a youth that was a young defendant in, in, in that case, 15 year old. Um, it, the divisional court has certified a point for the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has yet to decide whether or not to grant permission. But the, the, the certified point is the very stark one, which is whether or not decisions of the competent authority on um, as to whether or not somebody's a victim of trafficking are admissible in criminal proceedings. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting point. But at the heart of it, to come back to where I started from, at the heart of it, you have got this tension, it seems to me, between the state's duty to protect victims of trafficking and the state's duty to prosecute people for serious offences. The Modern Slavery Act, of course, um, is the Modern Slavery Act defence is only available to a limited cohort of people because there are a whole range of offences which are deemed sufficiently serious that the offence is, uh, the defence is not available to them, right? Uh, we tried to persuade the court that in those circumstances, um, the court should, the Court of Appeal should, uh, or the first instance court should continue, uh, even if the defence were not available under section 45, uh, to consider uh, using the abuse of process jurisdiction, whether or not the, uh, an indictment should be stayed. But, but effectively, we came up against the decision in DS and the, the court said, well, Parliament has now decided that, that, that this defence is not available if you commit a, a, an offence which is um, of, of a certain level of gravity. So effectively, we've tried that and we, we, we've, we've not... Um, we've not succeeded on that particular point. But the outstanding question of, 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 the, of the admissibility of the competent authorities' decisions is one, well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point and one which has not yet finally been resolved. But um, I was immensely gratified by the decision of the European Court in VCL. Um, it was quite a long, hard slog for um, and I'm immensely I'm delighted, obviously, for for um for the client himself because he's um he's been on a hell of a journey and it's um it's good to see that finally uh, he's um he's he's received some sort of justice. Thank thank you so much, Henry. I completely agree, and thank you for sharing your comments on such an important decision. Um, definitely have a few questions to ask in the Q&A section, so we'll come back to all the speakers. Um, I'm just going to hand over now to Rebecca Bain from Dow Street Chambers. Um, thanks so much again, and um, yeah, you're up next, Rebecca. Thank you, Hafsa, um, uh, and thank you, Henry, for setting out the legal principles so clearly. Um, Thank you for inviting me on as well. It's great to be here alongside far more accomplished panelists. I've been asked to speak about my reflections representing victims of trafficking and access to justice for victims of trafficking in the criminal justice context. And I want to focus on some of the main, in my view, practical barriers to access to justice for victims of trafficking in this context. And I should note that all of my observations obviously come from my own experience um, and my own experiences from, uh, from the trenches, so to speak. So front lines in the youth court and the crown court and other um, aspects where you really have first contact with a victim of trafficking in the criminal justice context. Um, my experiences are also, I should note, corroborated by those of my colleagues and within continued guidance that continues to be generated in this area. So I'm fairly confident that some of the remarks um, I make will resonate with other defence practitioners who have to um, tread the same waters. Um, I've represented 
victim of trafficking, victims of trafficking also in um, the context of uh, uh, appeals, advising on appeals and facilitating conclusive grounds decisions, which I'll come to um, afterwards. And, and the two, there's really two broad observations I want to make on practical barriers, which I'll spend the next 10 to 15 minutes discussing. Um, the first is out the, at the outset, so the earliest point, there's a lack of training combined with a culture of suspicion and disbelief by um, the police, by law enforcement, who will often be the first point of contact if the case is headed for the criminal justice system for these um, victims of trafficking. Now, there's, of course, exceptions and there's, of course, brilliant police officers doing brilliant work, recognising exactly how to apply these principles. Um, but I don't focus on those so much because they're, they're, they're not barriers to access to justice. Um, which is what it, it in fact causes the most harm in this area. So to, to develop this concern or this broad observation, one of the important points in VCL and AN that Henry's spoken about is that it was noted for the first time th that there's a, a, a positive operational duty within Article 4 of the Convention to um, identify, investigate and protect where a credible suspicion arises that an individual, it would be a suspect or a defendant in the criminal justice context, may be a victim of trafficking or exploitation. So a police officer confronts someone, there are certain indicators which say, well, there's a, I should have a credible suspicion that this person is a victim of trafficking and the duty kicks in. It's a mandatory duty under Article 4 <coughs> and it kicks in and steps have to be taken along those lines. Where this duty bites, the authorities, according to VCL and AN, um, must refer the suspect or person to a trafficking assessment. Um, and for us in the UK, that's the NR NRM process, which um, Ginger spoke about. And through doing that, they, they effectively comply with their duty to investigate uh, and attempt to identify. Uh, and a single competent authority within the Home Office um, makes a reasoned decision either concluding that they are victims of trafficking or, or they're not. And there's quite a bit of literature and guidance on what credible suspicion looks like. And I focus on that because that's really where most of the disputes arise in the criminal justice context in the front line. It's um, are they a victim of trafficking or could they be a victim of trafficking? If the police are unwilling to look into it, often their, their reasoning is, well, they're not victims of trafficking, so we don't we don't have anything to look into. Um, the literature comes from the Home Office, the National Crime Agency, the CPS, police officers, uh, police forces, um, which routinely publish guidance, policies, and research on examples of indicators of trafficking. So Henry spoke about uh, the trafficking of Vietnamese children into cannabis factories and. Uh, VCL and AN is very good because the way it criticizes the police and the CPS is by saying in 2007, the Crown Prosecution Service uh, and what was the National Crime Agency back then published pretty detailed guidance suggesting that if you find children in cannabis factories, that's a pretty good indication that they've been trafficked into the country. Um, nevertheless, the police and the CPS and indeed the Court of Appeal later on went on to ignore most of that in favor of what were called peripheral reasons. Um, to, to suggest that they weren't in fact victims of trafficking and they should reject uh, any assessment that suggested to the contrary. And so there are these policies, um, they're rife and they're rife for good reason. They're, they're designed to help police officers and the Crown Prosecution Service in the criminal justice context um, identify victims of trafficking and refer them where that's appropriate. But despite this, um, as I say, in my experience at least, you will turn up to court um, and your child client with a false ID document um, who has been sex trafficked has not been referred to the NRM process or your child client in, um, found in a drug house um, miles from home with no change of clothing and alone um, and clearly exploited by people far higher up the chain has not been referred to the national referral mechanism. And there's other examples uh, and they arise consistently I have about four or five cases on, um, which are very recent, just 
on the, this kind of metric of examples. Uh, and they arise consistently where the police simply refuse to refer the, the individual, um, despite clear known evidence trafficking indicators at play in that case. And it's not only a, um, I, don't, I don't mean to be so critical unless I have to, but it's not just an initial refusal to refer or initial failure to refer, it's a continuous, conscious, um, proactive refusal to refer, even where those issues and indicators are, are pointed out to um, the, the officers in charge of the investigation. And so what you have as, as a first step broad issue is law enforcement routinely, um, in my view, abdicate its obligation to refer potential victims of trafficking. That's not, say, that's not to say they never do it. They do, but they don't nearly do it as enough as they should be doing, doing it. And they opt instead to charge those people who end up in the criminal justice system um, as my or my colleagues' clients. Um, and more often than not, which is the, the more troubling aspect of how this works, is the reasons provided for rejecting the indicators of trafficking which exist in a case. Um, and some of them were highlighted in the VCL and AN judgment. Uh, for example, the person gave no comment and a no comment interview in, when police, why didn't they tell us they were a victim of trafficking? And VCL and AN says, well, you know, most victims of trafficking, particularly when they're children, don't self-identify as victims of trafficking. That's a strange suggestion. Or they give no comment interviews because they're in fear, uh, as Henry noted, of identifying the people who've trafficked them. Um, but that's used as a reason to say no. Um, or they give an interview and they admit being in possession of a mobile phone or some money. Um, and the attitude then is, well, you had a mobile phone, you had some money, why didn't you escape? Um, and then there's, there's also literature on that, on the level of control exercised by traffickers over their victims. And the fact that someone had an opportunity to escape and did not, does not explain away um, the fact that they may be a victim of human trafficking. But routinely we see at the front line these reasons being given um, to not refer people to the process. And VCL and AN is, a, is, a, is an excellent judgment because it cuts through all of this and it says, well, actually, um, not only do you need clear reasons to reject or refuse um, a conclusive grounds decision or to say that there isn't a credible suspicion to refer, um, these clear reasons need to be consistent with the definition of trafficking and they can't relate to peripheral issues that don't have a bearing on that definition. So the approach, um, uh, and the main issue right at the outset, or one of the main issues to access to justice for victims of trafficking arrested in some way or another, often under the control of their traffickers, is that rather than identifying these victims of trafficking, often the, the police approach is unfortunately to doubt they are exploited uh, and work backwards from there. Um, and it's an approach in, in, in variably, which is not protection based, it's prosecution based, it's informed by suspicion and maintaining quite uh, problematic, problematic misunderstandings. Um, that doesn't mean that the person doesn't get referred because that would be giving up and we shouldn't give up, obviously. Um, that means that defence representatives have to contact other first responders. So if you know how the national referral mechanism works, the police are one um, authority which can refer a potential victim of trafficking, but there's many others. There's local authorities, um, there are NGOs, and there are um, a, a list of these available on the government website. And so what we do as defense representatives is we contact the other potential referral organizations. A personal favorite of mine is the Salvation Army, who I think um, I've referred way too many cases to. And they have changed their automatic response in their inbox to say that they have a lot of cases on. So that's not my fault, but they, they, the result of the police or local authorities abdicating their role is that these NGOs have an exponentially increasing caseload. Um, and of course, as, uh, it's not just the police's fault, as awareness of these issues um, increases and policing of those issues becomes more effective and people become more conscious of them, including social workers, you have an increase of referrals. Um, and so just to give an example, ending that first broad observation, every single case I have had so far, and it is dozens, where the police have refused to refer and I have then consequently had to contact another first responder to facilitate a referral. Obviously I don't do the referral, the first responder does that. Um, we obtain, we've, we've always obtained conclusive grounds from the single competent authority. 
every single time we have had conclusive grounds that the person is a victim of modern slavery. Um, I have to say most of the time it's because they're children and children can't consent to their exploitation and the police often rely on the child's perceived consent as a reason not to refer them, um, which is far more basic error, but every single time um, it, it's arguable there was a, a failure to comply with police guidance, the, the Modern Slavery Act duty, and now the Article 4 positive obligation. So that's my first broad observation. It's that there's a failure often from the, the very start, which colours the process. Um, and it becomes a battle between the prosecution and defence rather than a joint effort to help the victim of trafficking who's been um, come across. Um, second observation is that there is also a significant reliance on the Crown Prosecution Service's discretion um, to not prosecute or in affording justice to victims of trafficking within the criminal justice system. And so again, we look at VCL and AN, and what that says is um, once you have a conclusive grounds decision, a positive one, from the body responsible for making these decisions, there is a duty to protect that person and accept they are a victim of trafficking um, unless there is a clear reason not to. And that's the word of the judgment, clear reason not to. Um, and I should say, um, by the way, VCLNAN is, is a great judgment, but things moved on considerably since VCLNAN were um, mishandled. And so over the past five to 10 years, mostly as a result of the work of people like Henry Blacksland in the um, Court of Appeal, there's been a lot of case law and a lot of development um, in domestic guidance, which seeks to secure precisely the same obligations. There's a guidance to investigate and refer before a plea is taken. Um, if possible, there's a, a, a four stage test, which the CPS have to apply to decide whether to prosecute. Um, and you have to accept um, effectively the conclusive grounds decision unless there's a good reason not to and the, the Crown Prosecution Service can interrogate it if, if they seek to. Um, but what we come up against with the discretion of the Crown Prosecution Service is once more there's this, um, I would say, awful, um, but it's a suspicion and a misplaced prosecutorial attitude towards victims of trafficking. And so routinely, um, the conclusive grounds decision, which say someone is a victim of human trafficking on paper, are ignored or contested, or um, that the, the CPS simply don't pay them uh, any attention um, for no good reason at all. Um, and well, sometimes they may have a good reason, but most of the time in my experience, it's not, it's not a good reason for the reasons outlined in VCL and AN. Um, and you have to remember when considering that kind of dynamic is that this is a decision made by the expert body set up by the government to identify precisely these issues. And despite that, it's far more likely that if you're turning up at the youth court or you're turning up at the magistrate's court or the crown court, that the CPS reviewing lawyer will say they disagree with the decision, sometimes before the investigation is even concluded. So you will literally just say there is an investigation ongoing and they will say, well, we're going to continue anyway, we're going to crack on. Um, and the, the, you get, you're confronted with that kind of attitude. We, we don't really, which effectively implies we don't really care what the competent authority says. Um, we want to prosecute and we've made our minds up. And so, we are having these conclusive grounds decisions generated, um, often an adjournment to facilitate that because protection of a victim of trafficking is important. And so adjourning the case um, shouldn't be that troublesome actually. And we have these decisions from the body set up by the state to identify these victims and for everyone to offer them protection. And then you have another arm of the state, the Crown Prosecution Service saying, well, actually, no, they are still not victims of trafficking. And even if they are, we'll prosecute them anyway, without giving um, reasons sometimes or good reasons otherwise. Now, obviously in the same way that we don't just sit back when, we, when the police don't refer, we go to other first responders. We don't just sit back when the CPS make those decisions as well. There's, there's a way to fight back against this. You, if you have a good reviewing lawyer, then you communicate with them and you point them to the right guidance and you say, look, actually, this is what the CPS say. This is what the Home Office say. These are clear indicators. Can you please make a sensible decision? And that can work in the youth court. It, it's um, laborious and it shouldn't be like that, but it, it can work and you can, we can get some quite positive results as a result. Um, or you run a trial or you get expert reports um, to persuade the CPS or there are other procedural arguments um, you can run where there's been a procedural failure 
um, to consider the decision, for example. Um, so an example of one of my cases is where the CPS said they just wouldn't even look at the decision in the youth court. And we wrote a pre-action letter and pointed to all the right guidance and um, the CPS discontinued the case in the end. But the, 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 there's different ways to handle different cases and it depends on the facts. Um, but it can be difficult because the courts themselves allow the Crown Prosecution Service a very, very wide discretion. Um, and as Henry has outlined, after DS, um, the court's jurisdiction on abusive process was severely narrowed to just the two traditional grounds. Um, cases like M and DPP really help. I am um, shocked, but not surprised that the Crown Prosecution, well, I'm shocked as in disappointed that the Crown Prosecution Service would want to appeal such a helpful um, judgment, um, which puts, before the criminal courts, a conclusive grounds decision made by an expert body, but at, that's that's pending. Um, in the meantime, obviously, the judgment can be relied on. Um, and I think to end, because I'm coming up to time, what's really disheartening about this process is it shouldn't be this difficult because the government's policies are aimed at protection of victims of trafficking at the forefront. So are the police's, and so is so is the Crown Prosecution Services. Um, and there should be an approach not based on wanting to prosecute and criminalize potentially, but on proactively seeking to protect. And it's often quite irrational because a prosecutor is often very willing to put their case against a drug dealer who has run a drugs line on the basis that that drug dealer has exploited children and drug users to do so. So they will say that in their sentencing remarks. Um, with the goal of increasing the sentence, because if you've exploited someone else to facilitate a drugs operation, then that's a higher sentence. And the judge is willing to accept that and they'll sentence someone on that basis, give them a double figure sentence and that's all fine. But when those same children or people who have been exploited, um, who are spoken about in the abstract come before the courts or come before a prosecutor, um, the criminal justice system suddenly struggles to accept that they are um, exploitees or that they have been mistreated. And that's, I think, the kind of stark, stark reality you see. One day you're representing someone who is higher up the chain and you're being told they've exploited all these people and they're really vulnerable. And then the next day you're representing those same vulnerable people and there's a complete refusal to acknowledge that. Um, and I think at the root of this is the conception of criminal justice that's predicated on punishing people and accepting a certain type of victim um, and ignoring nuances, even if they're in the, own, the, the, the authority's own guidance. And so as long as our law enforcement and prosecuting authorities maintain that approach where um, it's, it's very much about getting to the sentence at the end of the case, rather than seeing how best the case can be dealt with, victims of trafficking will always find it very difficult to, to be properly heard within the criminal justice system. Um, and it will be for everyone else, defence lawyers um, and people working, social workers, people working uh, around the clock with these people to pull the authorities up and ensure that they are um, treating these people the way they should be treated. Um, if I had time, I would talk about approaches in courts and case management and give horrifying examples of how sensitive our approaches to victims of trafficking during case management but I have spoken enough and I will now pass on to Professor Felicity Gary, who has far more interesting things to say. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure that's not true at all. It was absolutely uh, fascinating to lis listen to the presentation of uh, a young legal aid lawyer who is working to stop the prosecutions of vulnerable children. And I think it highlights the, the significant problems with the law on modern slavery and human trafficking in England and Wales particularly, that we are asking for a fundamental change of culture. What we're asking is that we move towards not prosecuting people. Instead of a criminal justice system, it's a not criminal justice system, if you like, just to put it in a silly way, just to understand that what people like us are trying to do is shift a whole criminal justice system to take a completely different approach to choose not to prosecute people who have committed crime. And it, it isn't just about balancing the duty to uh, prosecute crime and the duty to protect trafficked persons. It's about remembering that criminal justice is about identifying those people who are indeed criminally responsible. And in the context of trafficked persons, I, I genuinely don't agree with Henry that it is a balance. I think what we're having to do is 
expl still explain that the persons responsible for the crime are those persons who traffic the children or the vulnerable people and exploit people in the many and various ways as described in the trafficking protocol and the convention and so forth. Um, so it's almost about grasping our very basic criminal law that um, there is no criminal responsibility of those people who are trafficked to commit crime. And once we can get that message through to the prosecuting authorities, what they should be focusing on is those people further up the chain who are the people likely to get double figures because they're exploiting people in organised crime. And it has to rem be remembered that the UN protocol, of course, is a protocol to the convention against organized crime so uh, to tackle organized crime so there's a fundamental misunderstanding of criminal law in England and Wales it seems to me um, the second problem is that the whole uh, the law in this area in England and Wales is also focused on compulsion and there have been cases saying well can we extend duress and how do we look at the compulsion of individuals and again I think England and Wales has taken the wrong approach because by taking a compulsion approach what you're really saying is someone has to suffer a level of harm before they're going to be capable of seeking the sort of protection that is offered in England and Wales and as long ago as I think 2013 there's an academic publication by Hoshi that says well hang on we're going in two different directions here there's a causation model and a compulsion model and the English system grasped the compulsion model, sort of forgetting that it has some really good law on causation. And we can see it in concepts of innocent agency and so forth, where we can see that the crime is committed by those persons who are the traffickers. It's caused by them and not by the traffic person themselves, unless, and of course, they go, they, they take action that would amount to a an intervening act, a choice, an autonomous choice of that trafficked person. And I recently did a case called Rebello in Manslaughter, where I finally got the Court of Appeal to discuss women's autonomy, which I thought was marvellous. And to get Leveson to talk about women's autonomy was, was a, a great pleasure. And uh, for a while it wasn't reported, but I, it's, it's worth a read to think about um, the work of Hart, Hart and Honoré in the 50s talking about what does autonomy mean? That it means to be free, informed and deliberate. And most people we meet in human trafficking context are not free. They're often deceived and not informed. Um, they may or may not be voluntary. So if we think about that language of basic common law, we can encompass those people who are who are not deceived. They know they're carrying drugs, but they're not free to carry them. We can also encompass those people who are deceived um, because they're not informed. And it's in those sort of areas that it's very difficult to get prosecutors to decide not to prosecute because you get that language of, well, they knew they were carrying drugs and therefore they're not trafficked. So there's a real misunderstanding around autonomy and particularly women's autonomy. And the third problem in England and Wales is really that the the legislation such as it is with all its whistles and bells is so much later than other jurisdictions. You know, countries like the Philippines and Indonesia have had modern slavery human trafficking laws for decades longer than England and Wales, is that we chose to implement sec schedule, section 45 with schedule four that excludes a whole heap of other offenses, including accessories. So you might have an accessory who is used and abused and exploited in a way that is um, recognised as, as trafficking and yet if the ultimate offence is an offence within Schedule 4 they don't carry those protections unless you can persuade a prosecuting authority who's going down the wrong path to actually back off and not prosecute people and it leads to cases like mine that I've got at the moment which is a 13 year old child who is currently charged with murder for a kicking incident involving a group of people who are sent off to rob someone because they've got to pay money to the people trafficking them he doesn't even kick the person who died and he's charged with murder on some complicity basis and the prosecute that you can virtually see the prosecutor's head explode because he can't get his head around human trafficking, never mind a child with a number of other difficulties. So I think the English law is, is failing 
the commitments that we've made at international level, at European level, in terms of the protocol, the convention, all of those commitments to protection that we have, ultimately it fails. And it's taking those of us in the, as best we can to challenge in the ways that we can to try and move the criminal justice system in, in uh, the protective direction. Uh, without necessarily using the language of victim, but understanding that traffic persons are not responsible for their crimes. And the way I tend to look at it is that trafficked persons are doubly victimized by the state. As we heard from Ginger, uh, when we reflect on what's happened to her, she's vic victimized by traffickers and then doubly victimized by the state. And I think that, that we have to engage in that. We have to recognize that the system we have is compounding rather than protecting individuals. Um, and, I, and I worry particularly because of my experience with Mary Jane Veloso's case that we are particularly not dealing with um, these issues properly in relation to um, people who are trafficked abroad from Britain. So in those of you who don't know Mary Jane Veloso's case is there's me sitting in front of my computer and I was asked to sign a petition to save Mary Jane Veloso. And she had trafficked drugs from the Philippines to Indonesia. She'd been prosecuted and convicted of drug trafficking and sentenced to death. And there was a com campaign to try and uh, get her a reprieve. She was in Indonesia and the Philippine um, migration NGO was trying to get a campaign together to support her to get a reprieve. She was on the same death row as Australians Chan and Sukumar and who were shot. Um, and I decided not to sign the petition because I thought, well, it's political and I get a load of spam, but to contact them and say, well, I think I can help. And I think that's what's really important for young lawyers. You know, if you know something, if you've got an awareness about trafficking cases and the sorts of law that we're talking about, really share it, share it with your colleagues. The more people that are working in this area, the more likely we are going to create that shift domestically and globally. And the wonderful National Union of People's Lawyers in the Philippines, I had a Skype conversation with them the next day, and I won't tell you about all of it, but the referral mechanism in the Philippines was used. Her traffickers were identified. They were arrested. There was a 72 hour vigil. I went, she was taken to the island in the helicopter. I went to bed not knowing if she was uh, going to be shot or not. And the next morning she was indeed alive and she is still on what is called a temporary reprieve. But her traffickers have since been successfully prosecuting for trafficking others. And there's just been a case in the Philippines Supreme Court that allows her to give evidence from the Philippines, from Indonesia to the Philippines. There's a really great case to look up, but it's also really great to think about all those ways in which that could happen to uh, persons who are trafficked from the UK elsewhere. And what are we doing about trafficked persons on death row that might be trafficked from here? How are we, if we're not doing it properly domestically, then we're highly likely that we're not doing it properly abroad, especially if you're talking about places like the Philippines, uh, where, of course, you have currently a bill before Parliament to restore the death penalty for human traffickers, uh, which totally fails to understand the victim perpetrator paradigm, where some uh, traffic persons may indeed climb the ladder and carry out some elements of perpetration in order to survive. So some survivors in management positions who are, remain trafficked. And there's a, an enormous amount of misunderstanding around that as well. So I, they're, they're just a few stories to think about the value of legal aid lawyers in this context. Um, I think if you really want to know how it ought to work, the best example is, is Argentina. They're way ahead of us. And I've provided Hafsa with a link to a recent report that I took part in as a, a, an expert consultant uh, for the UNODC, which I think she's going to put in the, trap, in the chat, which is a um, document entitled Female Victims of Trafficking for Exploitation as Defendants. And it involves the interview of lawyers all over the world to see how it's working. And there's some real, um, expertise there way ahead of England and Wales and have been 
way ahead for a, a long time. If it's not already in the chat, I'll, I'll, I'll pop it in. Um, and it's really worth a read. My uh, keenness, of course, relates substantially to the treatment of uh, women and girls in this context. And I can give you a whole heap of stories in the Q&A, should you wish to do so, about how dreadfully women and girls have been particularly treated in this area by prosecuting authorities. That's a bit of a canter through what I think about the state of English law and um, how I think we should do better, particularly for women on death row, um, and how wonderful the work is that people are doing in this area. So um, that I think it's great that there's young legal aid lawyers here interested in this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for sharing your reflections and um, the study as well. Uh, we both posted it in the chat, so please do uh, check that out. Um, it's really, really um, interesting to hear about. And also, um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions on the kind of female, the, the females on death row that you mentioned, and also the, the angle of sexual exploitation. Um, a few questions have come in during the discussion, so I'll go to those first, but please do keep um, posting them. We have um, about 10 minutes or so to go through uh, some of the questions, so I'll get through as many as I can. Um, the first question that I will come to is um, a question that was posted earlier on, do you, it's, do you think referring a victim of trafficking alongside a victim navigator is an effective way of increasing prosecution of traffickers and giving a more holistic support to victims? Um, and that is a question to just anyone on the panel, uh, whoever wants to share their reflections on it. Um, and then I'll, I'll go on to the, the next two. Do you want to pick on one of us? I think we're all hesitating yeah. there. Yeah, go on, Felicity. <laughs> well, I was going to suggest um, Rabar because I suspect yeah. he's done a case with a victim navigator, but he's shaking his head. I think what you mean by a victim navigator is someone who helps the traffic person through the process. Yeah. I, I've talked about this for a very long time and um, published recently on trauma informed courts. That, and, and I think picking up on what Ginger said of, about the tendency to keep asking traffic persons about their story, which of course is re traumatizing for a start. Um, and dreadful by the Court of Appeal, there are a couple of cases, one of which I'm in, which is bubbling away, where they're suggesting that the person's going to have to give evidence in the Court of Appeal, even though there's a conclusive grounds assessment, which is remarkable to say the least. So I think the idea of having the equivalent, I suppose, of an intermediary who assists someone to communicate, an expert who can help a traffic person navigate the system without being re-traumatised is a fantastic system. I haven't done a case with that in, and we tend to ad hoc try and provide support. And I think um, Rabar's right. You need the, as much help as you can from NGOs. But um, if that answers the question, I, I haven't personally had a case with a navigator in, but I have had cases with significant support. And I think if we can avoid re-traumatizing someone who has been trafficked, that, that's a pretty good way of doing it. And I certainly know that that's something that um, uh, I should say, I have seen in operation in Cambodia. So there's a really great charity called Hagar um, that do a justice tour in Cambodia and they do exactly that. They help traffic persons navigate the system. They provide the protection and they provide um, training services for those traffic persons to get into work um, away from both the traffickers and the justice system. So there are examples in other jurisdictions that I think we can learn from. Um, that, that would be my view in relation to that question. I hope that answers it. I'm not sure it did, but I uh, hope that's helpful. Yeah, it was, it was definitely helpful. Um, does anyone else want to add anything to this question or um, shall I... Well, all I would say is to chip in. I mean, just just to give. To, I recently had experience of, mm -hmm. of doing a trafficking case in the Court of Appeal, where they, um, where my client was required to give evidence. Uh, I tried. The decision had already been made before I was in, instructed, and I tried to persuade them this wasn't a very good idea. But they, they ploughed on regardless. I think it's a shocking decision. I didn't know it was yours, Henry, but I thought it was a shocking decision and it's having a yes, knock-on effect yeah. to mine in England and Wales. So yeah. Um, yeah. watch this space. I might kick off a little bit about that, but yeah. I think just uh, the only thing I would add is it's very interesting because we heard from Ginger 
earlier about how um, accounts given, accounts are basically received at various times repeatedly and there are because of the trauma, depression, the overwhelming nature of the circumstances, it's very difficult to recall the accounts you've given. And these are precisely what the Crown Prosecution Service and the police then rely on to suggest that your account is untrue, even in completely tangential aspects that don't touch on whether you're a victim of trafficking. It's like you said you had a mobile phone in this account and then you said you didn't have a mobile phone on this account. It's just um, used to undermine your status as a victim entirely. Um, and then, you know, it, it's a very kind of traditional approach to what a victim is or what a victim should be or what a victim should sound like or look like or behave like. Um, complete cooperation, consistent account on day one and then the same account on the day of trial. And that's it, which doesn't work when you have circumstances like this. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important what you say about, about what a victim should look like. You know, if you get a stroppy woman, for example, which to use that sort of trope label, the chances of being also trafficked, found to have been trafficked are really low. And in fact, what somebody's doing is they've just got enough about them to say, hang on a minute, I'm trafficked. And to, to try and challenge this huge system, you're placing that burden on them. So I think that's right. There is There are some real stereotypes and tropes in this area that are being used to make decisions about people's evidence. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Henry, I thought you'd unmuted. If you no, were. no. I, I, I was just going to add something else, which is it's not not a mm. question, but I just want to add something to 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 um, Rabar's uh, contribution. Mm. Um, Section fifty two of the Modern Slavery Act, which is the requirement to um, refer somebody who uh, it is reasonably believed may be a victim of trafficking. Um, which is effectively the statutory provision, which is now, I mean, the, the decision in VCO and the European Court, which, which um, Robert referred to, um, I, I, I think in a way that the statutory provision is, is, is as important. Uh, and I have, I had a case um, relatively recently in which we had applied for a stay on the basis that we were submitting that there were, there was a failure to refer uh, uh, and uh, uh, without good reason. In fact, there were credible grounds to refer him. There were reasonable grounds to believe that this person may be a victim of trafficking. And we, our submission was that in, in the absence of a referral to the NRM, at the very least, uh, the um, the trial couldn't proceed fairly. Um, we lost on the facts, but if that, you know, the judge accepted the principle. Yeah. Um... And Ginger, you'd mentioned some uh, comments on the NRM as well. Um, I was wondering whether you had any reflections on changes that you would like to see in terms of when speaking to lawyers or when going through um, you know, referral mechanisms, anything that would support um, other survivors in terms of not being, not feeling that they're being re-traumatized or going through the process. I know it's quite a broad question, but um, in terms of your experience with the NRM um, and what the other speakers have mentioned, uh, if you have anything to comment, um, I'd be really interested to hear your perspective on that. Um, well, what I can say about the NRM uh, is um, the lawyers should uh, contact the first respondent. Like for me, I came in through the social services mm -hmm. and they have a record of me, they have my statement. So if lawyers are able to contact them and the NRM themselves and to get the first statement to begin with, then um, they can ask for my own statement, witness statement. The lawyer now should get the witness statement because I gave a witness statement to the police. And um, the police, if you go directly to the police, some police, Stations, they, they, they don't know what human trafficking is or, or what to do. Um, that's why sometimes it's nice you refer someone to the social services. And just like I heard someone say, um, Salvation Army, Salvation Army is good as well. But if the lawyers dealing with NRM uh, trafficking victims, they should contact the social services or the first responders and get the full statement even from the police and get the full statement from them, then we can take it off from there. Yeah, and um, another thing I'd like to see is um, 
um, for any trafficking victim or modern slavery victim, I'd love to see them, um, things should change for them in terms of work, okay? Because if you go back again and, and, and sit in the NRM, you start to think you don't know what tomorrow will bring for you. You don't know whether you get a conclusive ground or not. If you are rejected when you leave the um, accommodation, the safe house, where are you going to go? What next? Because like that, a person can be re-trafficked again. Because when you come out of the NRM, if you get a negative, what's going to happen to you? Or you get a positive, conclusive ground, how long are you going to stay in a house that they'll give you? Because I understand you can either go under asylum or, or they give you a, a discretionary leave DL. So that one is not for so long. It's just like one year and you, they have to accommodate you. Now, if they accommodate you, they give you a flat. The flat is unfurnished. Where are you going to get the money from? Because you're only getting 65 pounds. How are you going to, to help yourself with that kind of thing? So if they can help people that are in the NRM to, to probably get something like a job or, or, or look after children, like for me, I looked after that kid for almost 10 years. He's now 16, 17 years old. He's a very, he's a big boy. There were no social services involved or police. He, he, I raised him well. So if I'm in the NRM, they can help me get something even like a house so that I'm able to do fostering and look after other uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers or kids that are in the NRM. So if mm -hmm. the government can look into that, that would be fine for us. Thanks so much, Ginger. Um, that was really helpful and looking at kind of like in, in practice what it's like with the national referral mechanism. Um, there were a few other questions in the, in the chat. Thanks, um, Felicity, for providing uh, a link to the directory. It leads on to my uh, last question that I'll end with. It's just, um, I like to also to end with just talking about resources for everyone that wants to find out more about this area. So um, Felicity's just posted a really great resource, which is a um, trafficking directory. Um, I also am quite a big advocate of the Youth Justice Legal Centre Guide, which I came across while attending Rabar's event on child criminal exploitation. Um, and there's also a really good book written by my Sikand on human trafficking and modern slavery. Uh, I wanted to just go around the panel and just to ask about one, one or two resources that you'd recommend. Also the study by uh, Felicity that's posted in the chat uh, for everyone that wants to know more about trafficking, access to justice, and um, one slavery and all the kind of nuances within that. Uh, if you have, anyone has any other suggestions for resources, um, please do go ahead, either post them on the chat or just um, say them out loud and um, hopefully the attendees can go away and um, look look them up further. I know um, Felicity has quite a few resources. Well. <laughs> yeah, look, I've been, I've been battling along in the chat, so I'm sorry about that, but... Um, Obviously, Philippa Southwell at Birds is, uh, she runs the Human Trafficking Experts mm -hmm. page, which I've put there. So there's a whole heap of human trafficking experts there, which I think was useful to one of our attendees who's also a social worker. So it's worth yes. getting to grips with that website. And I can't resist giving a plug for our book. I contributed three chapters to Philippa's um, brilliant book. Uh, that I've put the link into that she does with Michelle Brewer and Ben Douglas Jones. We've heard all about Michelle taking BCL with Henry at, at the beginning. So those would be the two that I would plug for those more interested in international um, documents. I'll bung a few more in the chat while Henry and Rabara are giving their recommendations. I have no further recommendations. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the new edition of the book to which I've not contributed. <laughs> <laughs> it's out it's out you can buy one and and yep. there you go i'm sure you're in it all over the place henry so um yes it's out now um yeah i would i will say terrible track record recently i keep losing cases these cases there we go 
I think you have to lose to change things. So that's a good thing in many ways. Mm. Um, my, my recommendation is just to reiterate or, or repeat um, the book that's been noted, it's Human Trafficking, Modern Slavery, Law and Practice, um, Philippa Southwell, Michelle Brewer, and Ben Douglas Jones. That's also the book that Maya Sikand has contributed to, and it has a range of contributors across the areas of, of trafficking by um, really, really excellent people. Um, the other resource that's been mentioned is the, so the Youth Justice Legal Centre does amazing work. They're on the Just for Kids law on um, championing children's rights, and they have released a guide to which myself and Maya Sikand and Philippa Southwell have also contributed. And that's a very small guide, which gives you um, tip top tips on how to, um, I've never said that phrase, on how to deal with trafficking in the um, youth courts and when you have victims of trafficking um, across, so from start from the investigation across to appeals or sentence. Um, and that can be found on the Youth, Just, Just, youth Justice Centre, losing words, um, page. Um, and then the final resource is the actually the Home Office's own resource, which is the Modern Slavery Act statutory guidance, which was updated in January 2021. It's really, 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 really excellent. Um, and we just need the police and the CPS to start following it. Those are my suggestions. Brilliant. I've added the UNODC manual as well, which um, is 2009, but it's quite useful too. Um, I've just, yeah, I've just seen, um, and I'm also going to be sharing this on the Twitter as well, so it's, it's fine if you haven't noted down from the chat, um, oh, we'll have a live, a live three thread, um, I can't, I'm losing my words as well, <laughs> um, but thank you so much, I could talk about this for um, so much longer, and I know we have some more questions, but um, I know that it's, it's coming up to the, we're just past 8 p.m. now, um, I just want to say a big thank you to all the panellists for joining and know you're all incredibly busy practitioners and it's been a real honour and privilege to be hosting you this evening and um, just thank you so much for taking time out and thank you to everyone for joining as well. Um, I'll distribute the recording later and also the resources um, and hopefully we can continue um, this later um, in, in the year as well with the developments. Looking forward to reading the subsequent judgments and everything that you have highlighted in the, the ongoing cases. Um, so thank you so much again, um, and hope you all enjoy the rest of your evenings. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Well done. Thank Bye. you. Thanks so much.